is is it's a heart check. It's saying, hey, um, you know, make sure that you're trusting in Christ. Make sure you're watching watching over yourself. Make sure that you're you're entering into that rest. And so um, then you have verses 12 through 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so here in these 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 two verses is really an encouragement by Paul to say, look, if you are struggling with unbelief, don't hide it. And a matter of fact, you can't hide it. So in verse 12, we have the fact that the word of God is quick and powerful. It's living and it's active. Okay, it's it's doing its work. Every time you hear the word preached, it's active in your life. The Holy Spirit is using it. And what does it do? It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. I mean, it gets down into the most intimate parts of who you are. Uh, in the joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of heart. It knows exactly what's going on in your mind. That's why you can hear a sermon sometimes and go, uh, does this preacher know, like, did he go through my Facebook feed, or did he go through my Instagram feed and know exactly, like, what I'm going through? But that's the power of the Word of God, is that it gets down into the very deepest core parts of who we are and touches on the sins that no one else knows about, but that we're going through. And then in 13 is another encouragement. He says this, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, meaning no creature can be hidden from God. Okay? There's nowhere you can go on this earth where you'll not be seen by God himself. He says, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So God knows. God sees the sin in your life. He sees the struggle. He sees the unbelief. He sees the, the sin that nobody else knows about. It's open to him. You're almost, you're like, it's like you're naked before him. There, there is no nothing you can put on to hide. There's no clothing you put on, no, no stand in front of a tree or behind a tree. No, in God's sight, he can see all things. Okay, And this is used as encouragement. Yes, it should make you fear in a sense, but also it's used as encouragement to push us to verses 14 through 16. And so we see this in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So here it goes again. So so it gets on us, right? Um, and I love this about the Word of God. So it gets on us, and it says, the Word of God is cutting you up. It's piercing you. It's pointing out your flaws. It's pointing out your sins. You're naked before Him. There's nowhere you can hide. And then what does it do? It gets your eyes right back on Jesus. So it confronts you in your sin. It stops you right where you are. It says, look, this needs to be changed. But guess what? There's nothing you can do <laughs> to, to make God happy. And so what does verse 14 say? Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Well, who is this high priest? It's Jesus. Jesus, the one who made atonement, the one who gave his life, the one who ascended, the one who makes intercession for us before God. He has passed into the heavens and he sits on the right hand of God. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession of faith. There's the encouragement. He says, We know the mediator. Just like in the Old Testament, how the high priest went before the children of Israel, he went into the holiest of holies in the tabernacle, and he offered the lamb for atonement for the nation, and he interceded on behalf of the whole of all the people. Jesus, in the same way, is way better than that high priest because not only is he the high priest, he was a sacrifice, first of all, but he's also the high priest who then ascended. He rose again from the dead, unlike any other high priest before him, and he went to heaven itself before the face of God the Father. And as God the Son, he intercedes for his people before the Father, who fail on a regular basis. We have trials and temptations. And so this is the encouragement, though. Look at verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I love this verse. You feel down. You feel beaten. You feel betrayed. You've lost a loved one. You you may be had a financial crisis with your housing going on with, with COVID and maybe being out of work and all these things. There's nothing in your life that you've gone through that Jesus Christ has not also experienced with you in, in, and in himself, not just with you, not just like he understands. He has gone through it himself. You've lost a loved one. So did Jesus. Jesus lost Lazarus, right? Now, granted, he rose or raised him from the dead, but he went through the pain of what it felt like to lose somebody he loves. Okay, he went through that. He went through the pain of losing friends. 
friends that were disciples that followed him for a long time. And then he says one sermon, all of a sudden they all leave. And these people who he shared intimate fellowship with, they just disappear. Peter, one of his most beloved disciples. Have you ever been betrayed before? Peter, who said, I'll die with you, Lord. Jesus says, no, I know you're going to betray me. You're going to deny me three times. And what happens? It gets to the point where Peter's being asked all these questions by handmaids and servants, and he denies that he even knows Jesus, and he curses even about it to show the point, right? We fail, but Jesus has experienced all of these things. You know, are you hungry? Jesus went hungry. Do you not have money? Jesus didn't have money. Um, you know, yeah, Do you have, are you thirsty? Jesus went without water. I mean, but at the same time, it's funny how then he comes back and he supplies every single need. Are you betrayed? Well, then go to him. He's your best friend. Are you thirsty? Go to the fountains of living water. Are you hungry? Go to the bread of life. I mean, everything that we could need is found in Jesus. He truly is the high priest who not only intercedes for us, but he himself, because he took on flesh, went through everything we do. He's felt and experienced life just like we do. He's felt all the pains, the sorrows, the joy, the happiness that life is, the ups and the downs. And he says this, but he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So unlike the high priest in the Old Testament, who first of all didn't experience all the pains that people went through. Maybe there were some high priests that didn't have um, family members die. Or maybe there were high priests that were financially well off. Or there, there was high priests that didn't have to worry about food. Yet there were people in the congregation of Israel that did have to worry about those things. And so he didn't know their pain directly, unlike Jesus knows our pain directly. And then on top of that, he had sin. The very reason the high priest, uh, the high priest of Israel had to go into the, the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice was not only for the people, but it was for himself, for his own sins. But Jesus was tempted in all these points, like we are, yet he did it without sin. So then what is the conclusion? In verse 16, it's this, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So because he is, Jesus is sinless, and because he has been tempted in all these points, we can come to him and find the grace to escape and to find rest right now in these trials and in these temptations that we are going, going through. And look at the compassion that Jesus has and, and how Paul writes about it. He says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That's what we need. Even every, every day as Christians, we need grace to walk in the way we should, to walk after Christ, to have forgiveness of sins that we commit after we come into faith in Christ. We need to come and ask for forgiveness and confession and trust in the blood of Christ. And Paul says, look, this is the loving Savior that we have. This is the loving intercessor we have, the loving high priest. He says, come boldly unto the throne of grace. And we can because we've been adopted. Those who are in a family, think of a son, right? A son can run off the couch and jump right into his father's arms. Why? Because he has that relationship. He trusts his dad. He trusts his father. He knows that he loves him and cares for him. He watches out for him. In the same way, how much more do we have to come to Christ? Or how much more should we come to Christ? who not only loves us that much and way more than a father loves his natural son, but also he's experienced everything you've gone through because he himself has gone through it. Now, I'm not talking about the exact situations, but I am talking about the exact same temptations, right? The loss of friends, going without food, loss of finances, sickness, death, health, all of these things. Jesus went through them in his flesh. And so he knows exactly where you're at. And so you can come to him and not just come to him feebly or crawling that you can come boldly reverently right we ought to come he's our king we ought to honor him and reverent him so it's not irreverent but we can come with a sense of earnesty and boldness and um even um what's the word for kind of like a fast process i can't can't quite remember right now but we can come to him with a boldness and earnest and earnesty and kind of a uh, a need for grace, an immediacy, that's the word I'm looking for, that we need it now. Um, because look at this, the, these people were on the verge of leaving the faith. And Paul says, come in boldly now, find grace to help you. He will give you what he needs, what you need to get through this trial. 
And that's a severe trial. I mean, imagine being persecuted by your own family. Imagine being laughed at and having your property stolen and all these things because you profess faith in Christ. That's what they're going through. And he says, presently, right now, you can go to Jesus and find the grace to help in these times of need. It doesn't mean that all these things will be restored to him. That's not what he's talking about. It doesn't mean, oh, you're going to get your property back. You're going to get your family back. It's going to be great. No, Christ has far more greater promises than physical family and physical belongings. But what he does promise us is the grace and the mercy to get through the trial to keep our eyes on our final rest, which is Christ. That even though we suffer the loss of all these things, we can still be peace, peaceful in our soul. Why? Because it is well. Our sins, which were many against God, our offenses, which were piled up to heaven, have been wiped away. And Christ now is our Savior. He is our rest. Um, he is the way we have access to the Father. We have been adopted through Him. His blood has cleansed our hearts and our minds and has taken away all of our sins and the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us. And He took them and nailed them to His cross, taking them away. And God has forgiven our sins as far as the east is from the west. And that's the peace we have. That's something that no man can ever take from us, um, regardless of how much they do, if we keep our eyes on the Savior, if we by faith continue continually trusting in the simple promises of the gospel that yes you've sinned but christ came to be a savior of sinners and so i hope this has been encouraging to you guys i really hope that you if you're struggling with something you know even talk to me in the comments god gives fellowship also as a way to be an encouragement um, but i'd say you know if you're going through something serious there's no one that cares more and there's no one that knows more of what you're going through than jesus himself so you can go to him in prayer seek him go boldly and go persistently i think of the the man who in the gospels who needed bread from a friend because he had a friend coming out of town he knocks on his door and he says hey i have a friend but i don't have any bread can you give me some bread and jesus says even though that man will not get out of bed because he's his friend he will get out of bed because of his persistency <laughs> so he'll keep knocking and keep asking until he gives him bread and jesus says it's the same way he says ask and you shall have. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So don't just pray one time, but pray fervently. Pray constantly. Pray every day if you're going through something like that. And ask Him for the grace. And the thing is, is He will give it to you. He wants to. Uh, just going over that verse in verse 16, and then we'll end this saying that He does. He does want to give this to you. I mean, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Okay, so we can have these things. He wants us to have these things to help in time of need. In the greatest time that you need Him, it's there. Christ is offering it to you. Just go to Him. So this has been a blessing to you. Again, if you have uh, any comments or anything that you know you need pray for, um, go to Him, but also share them with me if you feel um, at liberty to do so. And I'll do my best to keep it in my prayers as well and to pray for you. Because again, I want this to minister to you. Um, and be a blessing. So I pray the Spirit would speak to you. Um, it's probably a little bit late now to say this, but I'll probably have to upload this in two parts just because of how big the file is. So if you stuck with the teaching this long, I do pray it's been a blessing to you, and thank you again for that. Um, and just, you know, let's encourage each other to to seek Christ and to trust Him, to love Him, and to come to Him in the time of need. So hope you guys have a great day. God bless.